so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, some of what I do um, at um, the University of North Florida and um, in gifted education. So the title of my talk is Gifted and the Big Bang Theory, What Pop Culture Communicates About Being Smart. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a graduate of the TAMS class of 1999. So you can see me um, in the picture. Um, that's me at prom with our prom prince. Um, so you can go back to TAMS 1999. There you go. Um, after TAMS, um, I got a bachelor's degree in art, and then I went on to get my master's in, um, in teaching at Austin College in education. So I was an art teacher. And then shortly after that, I um, went on to get my master's in um, education um, at Hardin-Simmons um, University in gifted education was my specialty. And then I went to get on my PhD in educational psychology and gifted education at the University of Connecticut. Um, and UConn is where they have the National Resource uh, Research Center on Gifted and Talented. So I was amongst um, really the epicenter of research and gifted education um, in this country. Um, my, as far as my career, um, I was an art teacher um, in kindergarten through fifth grade um, in Texas public schools. Um, and then after my PhD, I went on to become a university professor um, at first at um, Stephen F. Austin State University and now at the University of North Florida in educational psychology assessment quantitative methods are the types of courses I teach um, in graduate and undergraduate. Um, I'm also a researcher, um, and that's primarily what I'm going to talk about today. I've had more than 20 peer-reviewed articles in gifted education. Um, I've written a book called Letting Go of Perfect um, um, from Proof Rock Press, and I've also done book chapters, columns, and I um, do the cartoon for Teaching for High Potential that's put out by the National Association for Gifted, education, uh, gifted Children. I'm also the, um, the current chair of the Research and Evaluation Network. Um, for the National Association for Gifted Children and the awards chair for the research on giftedness, creativity, and talent for the American Educational Research Association and a founding board member of the Innovation Collaborative. So I have lots of expertise in this area. Um, so the first thing I want to start off and talking about is when you think about um, popular culture and um, you think about the characters that are portrayed, um, what characters come to mind as ones that could be considered geniuses? So you can just take a minute and think about that. Um, who comes to mind? Um, when I do this with my students, I often, um, you know, we, we, we think about um, characters like Sheldon from Big Bang Theory, um, or maybe Lisa Simpson, or Hermione Granger, or perhaps um, mad scientists like um, uh, Doc from, um, Back to the Future, perhaps, or maybe I'm just dating myself here. Um, so the first, so when we think about this, um, and I did this when I first taught this um, class with my honor students at University of North Florida, we sort of divide these characters into different archetypes. So what we're going to talk about today are different ways we could classify these geniuses in popular culture. So when we look at these geniuses, what are some different groups that we could classify them? And then we're going to pair this with different ideas in gifted education and what, the, what these archetypes might tell us about the research in gifted ed. So the first one is this golden boy, this hero, this classically good guy. Um, they tend to be overachievers. They're usually handsome or good looking. They save the day. They, in addition to their smarts and mental powers, they're usually physically strong. So these kind of superhero type characters. So in this group, we have people like um, Iron Man, Neil deGrasse Tyson, this like a real person, um, Kim Possible, um, Supergirl, um, Leonardo, or Donatello from the Ninja Turtles, right? So all these guys are really smart um, characters. Um, and, but when we think about this in the context of gifted education, and we think about perfectionism, and this idea that um, if I'm really smart, I should be perfect, that I should be able to do everything that anyone asks me, and it shouldn't really be that much of a struggle. And this is this myth that sometimes we fall into as really smart people. Um, so having these unreal, unreasonable goals, and what this can lead to, and what we see in the gifted population, is that it can lead to procrastination. So if I put this, um, if I put this in 
in uh, into uh, I'm sorry, if I put this into um, context, so if I try really hard um, and I do things up front um, and then I don't reach the goal, then that's devastating. But if I put it off and I don't try that hard or I do it at the last minute, then I almost have an excuse why it didn't turn out that well. Or I'm so overwhelmed by the task that it's hard for me to, to begin because I'm so afraid of not doing it perfectly. So sometimes this leads to these, this unhealthy strategy of um, procrastination. So some of you who um, may put off your tasks or wait the last minute to do a project, um, now you have a reason why that happens, right? Um, another, another thing that can happen is that you have um, um, underachievement. So sometimes when we see perfectionism, we see that, um, that rather than um, put our put all of our effort towards something and not be successful. We see gifted kids um, underachieve or just not try um, because they're afraid of success. So it's better to not try and not be successful than to try and have the possibility of not being successful. Um, it can also lead to lots of anxiety. So I think this is the group that I see a lot of students who are in this path, like at TAMS or at other high achieving schools, where we um, we have a lot of anxiety around perfectionism. So we we put ourselves in places we really challenge ourselves, which is amazing. But then we're always worried or anxious about not being as successful as we think we should be. Or when we reach places where we're not as successful, or when we do reach that area of challenge, or we're at that place where it's the first time in our lives where we've been challenged, or we have a point where we might not be a, um, making that A that we thought we always would. Um, we, our whole identity um, becomes into question um, because who are we if we're not that kid who made an A? And um, it leads to these really unhealthy ideas of, around anxiety and perfectionism. Um, and this dichotomous thinking. So um, my favorite quote from a gifted kid is this like, oh my gosh, I failed this task. I made an 89. And of course, an 89 is not failing, right? But in our minds, and of course in my mind too, an 89 is like failing, right? It's, it's a B. And, if I don't make an A, what am I? And and it is like this dichotomous thinking of it's either perfect or it's not worth doing or I failed. Um, and all of these are really unhealthy behaviors. And what we'd like to see is this idea between adaptive and maladaptive perfectionism. So what I've just described is this maladaptive perfectionism, this idea that I have these unrealistic goals. It's not realistic that we're going to be perfect all the time. But what is realistic is that we have high goals and you do if you're at TAMS, right? You do if you, you're challenging yourself and you're pursuing things that you love and that you're, you're trying your hardest. Um, but what we want to do is say that we can achieve these things. We know we're going to make mistakes. We know that when we take risks, intellectual risks, we know that sometimes they're not going to be successful. And that's okay too. Um, and that the important thing is that we're keeping on trying and that that, that doesn't define us. Um, so that's, that's just kind of the other side of this golden girl. And what we don't see in the movies, what we don't see in popular culture, is the times in which these characters aren't successful. These times when they sometimes fail. So let's look at the next um, archetype, which is evil genius. So the opposite of our golden girl myth, right, is, is these evil geniuses. Um, they're um, people like um, Lex Luthor or the Crane or... Um, Moriarty or the or um, the brain from TV and the brain, right? The, the the people who are they're really socially adaptive. They um, but they have malevolent, malevolent motives. So they um, they are able to manipulate people using their genius, right? For for bad purposes. Um, so this idea that that being smart is is sometimes a really bad thing, right? That that it leads to malicious motives. Um, and so how does this affect our society? And I think this is a really interesting question, this idea that, that perhaps being smart and that this um, threat that society might have from the most talented, the most smart people in our society, um, and how that leads to questions about funding or questions about programs for gifted students. So certainly, um, as we've seen over the last 20 years or so, funding for science, 
um, for research, for education has gone down. Um, and is that, you know, even for, for programs like TAMS, um, is that because we are thinking about um, these, how much has the idea in popular society about evil genius affected the ways in which we, even at a subconscious level, are thinking about the smartest people in our societies. Um, and even the belief in science. So this idea of these scientists who are these really smart people who maybe have malicious motives or who are using their smarts for evil, um, does that affect the way that people view um, the smartest people in our society? Um, and I just think that's a really interesting question for us to consider how popular, popular culture might be influencing the ways in which we develop policies in this country. Okay, the next um, stereotype, which kind of goes along with this idea, is this idea of a mad scientist or inventor. So we think about people like um, um, the doc from um, Back to the Future or Beaker from The Muppets or Dr. Frankenstein or even um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Willy Wonka. Um, they have these like really unusual ideas. And the mad scientist can either be good or evil, right? Um, it goes either way. Um, and there's some overlap in these archetypes. Um, but the mad scientist tends to be disorganized, eccentric, and really has this lack of understanding of the way the real world works. And kind of going along with this idea of funding for the sciences and our belief in science in general, how does this affect the way that scientists talk to the world about science? So this is something really relevant to you guys at TAMS, right? And as you're thinking about science, um, how does this, how does the way that scientists talk to the world perpetuate this stereotype or archetype? Or how should the typical member of society be able to understand scientific principles, especially as science moves beyond what's taught maybe in high school? Um, what is the responsibility of the scientific community of researchers to communicate their findings to the public? And I have this picture of Neil deGrasse Tyson because of course, his whole goal, right, is to communicate science to the masses. But he gets pushback sometimes from the scientific world for not being like a real scientist, right? Um, but what role do we have as researchers, as bearers of this science, to communicate this in a way that makes it understandable? And to the extent that we don't do that, how does that affect the way that people view us as, as important? as fundable, right? Um, and all of those things, right? Um, and then especially as we're thinking about this, um, as this pandemic is going, right? Who are we listening to and who's important in the conversations? And this is becoming really apparent in our society of how do we, who do we rely upon? What sources are important and how do we communicate this in a way that's understandable? Um, so it's really relevant and also, um, we have this idea of a scientist using incomprehensible language. We think about Beaker in The Muppets and he, he doesn't even use English, right? So how do we, is that comparable to the jabbering, right, that scientists use and their jargon? And how do we communicate that well to others? The next one is the perceptive detective. So this is this idea that, um, that there's these detectives who use some sort of either um, supernatural sense or just really intense genius to solve mysteries or to be able to solve problems um, better than others. Um, but they also typically also have low social skills that kind of go along with this. So we have people like Sherlock, right? Um, but we also have um, Dr. House, if you ever watch that TV show, um, Dr. Bones um, and Psyche, this idea that, that these are characters who um, can solve mysteries, can solve problems um, using their genius in ways that are unreachable to others. Um, and this kind of happens when, um, when smart kids um, don't meet expectations. So what happens when when smart kids aren't able to, to solve those problems in the way that we might think of as Sherlock or a Dr. House being able to do. And so this kind of goes along with this idea of underachievement. So what happens when a gifted kid 
um, is really, really smart, but then isn't able to achieve in school. Why does that happen? And I know that you guys know kids like this. Right at Tam, um, not maybe at Tams, but maybe your friends who aren't at Tams, or maybe there's some kids at Tams who aren't achieving the way in which you might have expected them to. And then we know from research there's some reasons why kids don't achieve. Um, sometimes it's an, is an issue of confidence. This idea of can I be successful here? So um, if I don't think that I can be successful then I might choose not to try. So that might have a little bit to do with that, like we talked about perfectionism before. If I don't think that I can do well, then it's better for me not to try than to try and not be successful. Or if I don't feel like I fit in, or I don't feel like the teacher or that the environment is supportive of me, I'm less likely to try to achieve. So you can all think about a teacher and the relationships that you have with teachers. Um, you can think of a teacher that you really care about um, and you worked harder for that teacher, right? Than for a teacher who you didn't care about, right? A teacher that in fact maybe you didn't like at all. You were much less likely to work hard for than a teacher you cared about their opinion for. So we know that those relationships matter. Another one is if, if you have the background skills to do well. So sometimes we assume that gifted kids have just learned through osmosis, right? So just somehow you picked up on these skills. Um, a great example for me is um, when I was in ninth grade, I took an English class and um, she expected us to be able to write well. And she expected us to be able to use proper grammar and English skills and all of those things. But it turns out that through my entire educational experience, no one had ever taught us um, grammar because we were in the gifted class and we were doing other things that were creative and imaginative and no one had ever bothered us how to, you know, like write a complete sentence. Um, and it was, it was kind of humorous because at some point she was like, wait a second, you guys never learned grammar. How did you never know these things? And we're like, well, just because we're gifted doesn't mean anyone ever taught us things. So sometimes, Gifted kids are just assumed to have learned things, but they don't have the background skills. So just because you're smart doesn't mean anyone ever taught you anything. So we have to sometimes teach kids things or you have to learn things like how to study. I know when I came to TAMS, it was the first time that I'd ever encountered a book that I didn't automatically know how to read. And I realized I had like very low reading comprehension skills and I really needed help in learning how to read a novel or a book that was above my reading level. And it turns out that all of my school, K through 10th grade, I never had a book that I didn't know how to read. And it was a real struggle for me. And looking back now, I realized what I really needed was a really good reading teacher. And it turns out that college professors are actually kind of terrible reading teachers. I don't know if you know this. And if, in elementary school, I didn't encounter text texts that were difficult for me, elementary school teachers are actually really good at teaching reading comprehension, right? Because that's what they're trained for. So sometimes when we're not successful as college students, as TAM students, it's because we're lacking some of those learning skills that we would have learned earlier if we hadn't been gifted. So sometimes it's lack of background skills. Sometimes it's skills like time management. That can be really, really hard. Like learning how to study um, and and pace that out because maybe I never really had to study before I came to TAMS. Things just came to me. And then all of a sudden work was really, really hard. And I had to, I had to somehow figure out how to balance all of that. And it's hard, right? So it's organization, those kinds of skills too. Um, sometimes it's attainment value. What attainment value means is it's this idea of um, how am I going to use this? Why is this valuable to me? Sometimes, um, I know for me, honestly, a lot of times I, I do things because, um, or I studied a lot in school because what was really important to me was making a good grade. So the, the value, the reason I did things was that external reward. Um, but a lot of kids aren't motivated by that. So sometimes we have to make that connection to um, how is this going to help me? How is this connect to what I want to do in life? So I want to become um, an engineer. I need to learn calculus because that's going to help me become a better engineer. Right? Um, and then there's also cultural influences. So if we don't have role models um, um, that 
in our in our paths and our careers that look like us that that speak like us that are from our own backgrounds it's hard for us to see ourselves in those careers and those jobs so if um, as a female, if I only ever have male professors in my science careers, it might be hard for me to see myself as a scientist, right? If I only ever see those role models. Um, so having those cultural influences are also really important and might also explain sometimes why we see underachievement in students. Okay, the next one is the next example, we have our hackers and computer geeks. So these are these nerdy, socially isolated, almost exclusively male, antisocial computer guys, right? And you know the people I'm talking about, right? So uh, yeah, here we go. Um, so so Nedry from from um, from Jurassic Park is like a classic like computer guy, right? And and I, I do have one example of a female from. Um, from criminal minds, but almost almost every other example of a computer geek is male, right? And and they're socially isolated. No one really likes them. They're they're um, they're unattractive, right? Um, Antisocial, just ugh, right. No one wants to be around them. They just spend their whole days in their computers eating junk food, right? Never seeing the light of day. Um, why is this, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, so let's look at, at um, what this tells us. And this really, to me, um, tells us a lot about gender differences. And we know that some of the biggest gender differences in the STEM careers is in computer sciences, right? Um, so what effect does this have when all we see in media um, are, um, are women in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, in STEM. So, um, and how does, so we know that this has an effect on women in, in STEM, and how does this affect men in other fields? So um, I obviously teach in education. So what I obviously, what I see are a lot of white females in my classes. So are there, there are other fields in which we, we see an abundance of females and not males. So how does media play a role in this? And does it, right? So um, I don't know if you've ever seen this Netflix move, um, show, Project MC Squared. Um, but it's, it's clearly for younger children. Um, but it's, it's got these four girls who um, are into science. And it's a really interesting take on this gender differences because in some ways it perpetuates gender stereotypes because these are very girly girls and they very much fall into this makeup, social media, high heels, blah, blah, blah. Um, but at the same time, they're also really interested in science and they solve these mysteries, but then they have these crushes on these boys. Anyway, it's, 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 um, it, it opens up this idea of what does gender, how does gender play into these roles and how do we help break down these gender, gender stereotypes for young girls? Okay. Um, and what are your experiences? Um, obviously, um, as we're as we're thinking about um, women in the sciences, um, does does this line up with your experiences um, in PM? Okay, so the next um, the next one is flawed genius. So these are um, these are people who are brilliant. They have some sort of disability, or they just don't quite function in the normal world. They are clumsy. They're disorganized. Maybe socially awkward. Um, they they're smart, but um, so this is like Sheldon, right? So he is brilliant, but he doesn't quite fit in, right? Um, a Beautiful Mind, um, this movie starring Russell Crowe talks about um, John Nash, who's a real character, a real person, right? Um, who, brilliant mathematician, um, who also had schizophrenia. Um, the character from, um, Oh my gosh, um, Monk is another good example. Um, Steve Urkel, see I'm dating myself here with how old this show is. Um, but this idea of, of we're, it's not the golden child because these are, these are good people who have flaws, who, who have difficulty in the world in some way, right? Um, so this leads into this idea of twice exceptionality. And some of you might fall into this category as well. These are, these are people who are gifted, but have a disability. And four things can happen with this. Um, the first one is that 
um, you, both things are diagnosed so that you are you are identified as gifted and your disability or your exceptionality is diagnosed and and you get help for both and hopefully that's the idea right um, on the other side of that um, they could mask each other so you're never really identified as gifted because of your disability you're never really identified for your disability because your giftedness masks that one um, or you could be identified as gifted um, and because you're so gifted that your disability is never identified or identified really late. And I see this happen a lot with it, um, with my honors students is that they've been able to cope all the way through and then in college or maybe at camps, um, they realize that they're they're really struggling and they they do have a disability, um, but they've been they're so smart that they've been able to compensate this whole time. Um, and so it might be attention deficit disorder, it might be anxiety, it might be depression, um, some of those things. And because you're so smart, you've been able to compensate this whole time because you're a genius, right? Um, but um, at some point you hit a wall and it's important to know that this happens and that, and then a lot of times this diagnosis doesn't happen until much later than normal or if you didn't, if you weren't so smart. And then the other thing that can happen is that you get diagnosed with your disability um, and you, your giftedness is never really recognized so that you automatically get this diagnosis of maybe ADHD as a young child and, and no one ever really recognizes how smart you are because that, that diagnosis comes first. Um, and the, the tricky thing is, is really figuring out the differences. So um, sometimes we think that like, for example, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, a lot of the symptoms that we might see um, for ADHD have some overlap with, um, with giftedness. Like if you're really bored in school, maybe you're also, you know, um, a little fidgety and you're not paying attention because you're, you know, thinking about other things. So sometimes there's, there's some overlap in what those symptoms look like. Um, and it's also a little challenging for schools to kind of know what in the world to do with you guys. You're a challenge. So um, a lot of times schools are even hesitant to, to give a kid a diagnosis if they're in the gifted program. So there's a lot of challenges to kind of figuring out what to do with you guys. Um, but it's important to note that, um, that what we do know is that the, that the instances of psychological disorders is not greater among the gifted population, nor is it less. So it happens, but it doesn't happen more often or less often. Um, in fact, I just did a huge research study on this looking um, at early childhood. Um, and I did kind of show conclusively with a national database that gifted kids are not less healthy than non-gifted kids, which has been a source of debate. So there you go. Um, and finally, our last category are child prodigies. So in the, in the media, these are kids who are really precocious, have a large vocabulary, mature for their age, and usually have some sort of exceptional childhood. And typically this is exaggerated, right? So we have, um, I don't know if any of y'all saw the movie Gifted, but this little girl like is doing calculus in, in kindergarten, right? Um, Hermione Granger is another good example, um, Lisa Simpson, um, and um, Brick from, um, from the middle is another good example of a child prodigy. There's tons of examples, right? Um, so how accurate are these, these depictions? Do they distract from real needs? So sometimes what I do is when I talk to parents or I talk to kids, like, um, I'm not really gifted because, you know, I wasn't doing calculus in kindergarten. I'm like, well, okay, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who was doing calculus in kindergarten. Maybe some of you, but probably not, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that you're not gifted or that you're not really, really smart. Um, that those are really exaggerations upon what really happens. Um, there's this idea of, also this idea of early rise, early rot, or this idea that if I'm really, really smart early on, does that mean that um, what's, what happens later on in life? What happens to these young prod prodigies? Um, do, they, do they kind of cycle out? And what we know from some really great longitudinal studies is, is no, that kids who are accelerated, kids who, who, um, who are advanced, and who proceed through school more quickly, like you guys, um, tend to have really successful life outcomes, that, you, that this success tends to continue on through life and that we have really good things that happen. Um, and the reason I have a picture of Malcolm Gladwell here with, uh, with a cross to him is this 10,000 hour rule. Um, I don't know if any of y'all ever read the book Outliers, but um, it's the bane of fine system. It's this idea that, um, that it takes 
this arbitrary 10,000 hours of practice to become good at anything. Um, and, and that it's, it's this idea that, um, that that's, that it's this 10, well, A, that 10,000 hours is pretty arbitrary, that, that there's no evidence really that shows that 10,000 hours of practice makes you a genius or an expert in something. Um, that's just practice, right? That it, that what we know from the research is that it takes some natural talent plus practice, but that it takes a varying amount of practice depending on the field, depending on what you're doing, and depending on your own natural abilities first, right? Um, so um, I am by no means a musician. Like I am so tone deaf, like for real. Like I think it might be diagnosable. I could practice the piano for 10,000 hours. I would never become a concert um, pianist because I just really have no sense of rhythm, no sense of music. It, it, it wouldn't make a difference, right? Um, but I also probably wouldn't practice 10,000 hours because I really kind of hate it and I'm probably bad at it, right? So the people who tend to practice for those many hours for, for long periods of time are people who tend to have natural abilities, right? Because I, I'm not really going to do something I'm not good at. Um, but, and if I do practice a lot, I am going to get better, right? So even if I did practice a really, really long time, I'm going to get better at playing the piano, even if I never become a concert musician, right? So there's an interaction between the two things. Um, so we can all get better, but we're all not starting at the same point. Um, okay. And then our last, our last one is the wise sage. So, um, and whether or not we consider a wise sage um, a genius or not is, is the next thing we'll talk about. Um, but this is an older, elderly person, a, pos a possessor of wisdom and experience. Um, in the hero cycle, he leads the hero to the right direction, this mentor. So we have like Gandalf. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, Dumbledore. And um, so my last question for you guys is, does our society value wisdom? And what, oh, what's the difference between wisdom <coughs> Excuse me. and intelligence? Um, and which one's more valuable? So do, do we value the wisdom that we get from our elders? Um, or do we like the newest, the youngest thing? Um, and what can we learn from our mentors and from our elders? So now I would love to take questions from you guys about what, um, about today's lecture, um, about gifted education or gifted children, about my careers. Um, <laughs> or, you know, um, about educational psychology and how you might get into that or about what TAMS was like. So um, I'm going to read through some of your comments, too. Um, beautiful. Thanks, Hope, for the presentation. Um, one of my questions I get into debate with a professor here on campus was uh, the big aspect between um, high achieving versus gifted. Uh -huh. And... and that label itself, um, gifted mean something almost is bestowed upon you, um, whereas um, high achieving almost gives you the uh, growth mindset of saying, if you're not, maybe you can be type of thing. Um, and how important are those labels and, and what impact might they have, not only on the individual student, but also maybe on the profession? That's really interesting. So. You know, and that's one thing, like, our field hasn't come up with, like, one definition of gifted. So I would say, if I asked 10 different gifted education researchers what is gifted, I would get 10 different answers. Um, so, but to go to your point, there between gifted and a high achieving and maybe high ability, um, I would certainly, sometimes I think that people discount high ability or high achieving as maybe they're not gifted. Um, but I don't think that you can achieve at a high level unless you had the potential to do so. So, um, especially in my state, in Florida, we only identify gifted based upon an IQ score. Um, so there's lots of kids who are in all AP classes who are, you know, doing amazing work, and yet they were never identified as quote-unquote gifted. Um, so they'll be like, well, I'm not gifted. And I'm like, but you're achieving at high levels and there's no way you could do that unless you were gifted. So on one hand, I don't think you can be high achieving without being gifted because that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't make sense, right? Um, on the other hand, if I was given a choice between being high achieving and being high gift, being gifted, I would say being high achieving and having that work ethic is probably 
much more correlated to success in life than, um, than having that label of being gifted. Um, so um, that's what I would choose for my own child, right, is, is high achieving. Um, but um, I think that we're probably also missing a lot of potential in our society when we're not recognizing those gifted kids who are underachieving and figuring out how to motivate them in society and in our schools to help them achieve at higher levels. So what are those pieces that we're missing in schools to help them um, reach their potentials? Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Oh, sure. I have a question. So what, what do you think is the goal for a gifted and talented education program? Um, because I, I know that um, testing students to get into that class, um, it, it's meant to challenge them, but um, I, it's sort of a different angle on education, I feel like, because I grew up going to a gifted and talented class when I was in grade school and it was very different from my other classes. It was a very different style of teaching, very different style of uh, learning. And I wonder what the goal is to have this class um, and not have it offered to other students that don't necessarily test in that range. That's a really good question. And I think that's a question that gifted education as a whole has to answer. Um, because if it's just a fun class with enrichment activities, it's really hard to justify why everyone couldn't do it, right? And honestly, if it's a class that everyone would benefit from, everyone should get it, right? Um, then it becomes a question of equity. So ideally, a gifted education program is providing um, the necessary supports for gifted learners. And a lot of times I like to think about a gifted program in the same way that I would think about a special education program. That if you think about intelligence as the normal distribution, right? That we have kids on either end. And if we think about the supports that, it, that kids in special education need, um, we think about kids um, on the other end, on the upper end, also needing additional things in the classroom that are maybe more challenging, that allow them to go in more depth and to go at a faster rate. So we should be providing those types of supports for kids in schools um, so that not everyone would benefit or need a gifted education program. So they should be programs that are providing um, in-depth projects or accelerated um, programs at a faster level. Um, however, I will be the first one to say that that is not as what is happening in many school districts across the country. Does that answer your question? It does. That's a different way of looking at it, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Other questions? Oh, we can give you some photos, you know, for your presentation of TAM students, so you can throw their faces up on there with those celebrities as well. So. Oh, oh yeah, oh absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, I can't believe there aren't more questions about what TAMS was like in the 90s, because man, got some stories. Easy. <laughs> um, I, I can also um, talk a little bit about what life is like in academia. Um, as a professor and how I got into that. I will say um, when I was at TAMS, the best um, advice I got from Dr. Um, from Dr. Sinclair was um, in seminar, he told us that you should never pay for grad school. And for whatever reason that stuck with me throughout all of my career. And I didn't pay for grad school um, throughout my, I had different assistantships and things like that. But the best thing I did in my doctoral program was um, go full time and have an assistantship. And that really helped acculturate me to what it's like to be a professor. So as you're thinking past your undergraduate degrees, you should definitely be thinking about um, grad school and what that looks like and how to, how to be a part of academia in that way, if that's the career goal that you're looking for. Okay, so I see a question here. What did you do during your time at UConn? I was actually supposed to go there in the summer and do a research program under the Renzulli Center. Oh, 
I, I worked with Joe Benzuli. He was one of my, um, he was, he was the director of the program that I did my doctoral degree in. Um, so they, at the National Research Center, um, and they did, they do an amazing um, summer program where they have um, high school students work with college professors to do um, internships um, with different, different professors across campus. Um, so that's, and it's um, this mentorship program. So that's a big part of what Dr. Manzuli thinks about um, giftedness. So his, his conception of giftedness is that no one is a gifted person, but you exhibit gifted behaviors um, in certain people under certain circumstances at certain times. So no one's expected to be gifted all the time. You're only gifted um, when you're put in a situation in which you could exhibit gifted behaviors. So the goal of a school system would be to put situations in front of you where some people could exhibit those gifted behaviors, which I think is really interesting. And so his idea is that if we give kids really challenging projects where they can do the work of professionals in the field, then they'll have these opportunities to, to reach their full potentials. So that's what this mentoring program that he's about. So he does these things called type three activities. Um, so here's another question. Do you think the gifted and talented programs prepare kids for college? Is that their responsibility? Um, so I like to think about gifted programs as um, helping kids um, and meeting their needs in the moment. So when I talk to parents a lot, you know, I'll talk to a parent of a four-year-old and they'll say, I need to get my kid into this preschool so they can get into this elementary school so they get into this middle school so they get into this college blah 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 and I'm like whoa what we need to do is think about what's the best for your kid right now so I think ultimately if you're preparing if you're meeting a kid's needs all the way along then that will help them reach their full potential but I'm not really sure that that that's always like an ultimate goal for college um, it should be that I'm helping the kid meet their needs where they are right now, and that hopefully that's leading them in this process to get to college. Um, at the same time, we do need to be teaching kids the skills they need, um, things like um, preparing them to manage time, to do projects, to have good reading comprehension and note-taking skills, which I don't think we always do. Um, that's, that can be really tricky, I think, um, to prepare kids. Um, for especially gifted kids, I see so many kids in my honors program who don't actually um, have the skills they need for college in the sense of these really basic skills, lots of times things that other kids learn in elementary school, like reading comprehension, like study skills, like time management, um, that if I had been a regular kid, I would have learned really great reading comprehension when I read, you know, um, Harry Potter when I was in fourth grade, but when I read Harry Potter in second grade, it wasn't hard for me. So I never really encountered a challenging textbook until I was in college and it was really, really hard. Uh, other questions? Yeah, I do have a question. Uh -huh. I was just gonna say, I have a question for you. Um, so during your time in TAMS, did you know that this is the career field you wanted to go into or were you uncertain or did you have a completely different mindset about what you wanted to do during TAMS that um, you kind of, you know, went this way instead? Excellent question. Okay, so I entered TAMS thinking I was going to be a chemical engineer mm. and then I took physics. <laughs> and, um, and I think, um, you know, I, I, I reached some of those, those questions and then this sh helped shape even my dissertation, which was that I reached a level of challenge and I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know who I was if I wasn't really, really good at something. Like if I wasn't really, really good at science, who was I? So at the same time, while I was at TAMS, I took a lot of art electives. So um, when I went to Austin College, I honestly looked at the college book and was like, wow, I can graduate the most quickly if I have a degree in art. So I grad so anyway, graduated with a degree in art and um, became a teacher. And while I was a teacher, um, I took all the professional development that I could because I like to take professional development, which is weird. Um, and um, one of those was on gifted education. And I, so I took the one week on gifted education and then 
um, I found out that I could get a master's degree or I could get um, my gifted endorsement if I just kept taking some more classes in the evening. So I did that because those were free. And then I realized I was only two credits away from a master's degree. So I took two more classes. And then, um, and then by that time, I realized I was really unfulfilled with my teaching career. So I, um, so, and I was really, really interested in research. So I was teaching elementary art. And I looked around me and I had a fabulous teaching job. I was in one of the best schools. I was around some of the best teachers that I could imagine. And I was, I was teaching art, like how fun is that? And I realized I would much rather be doing this research than um, finger painting with my students. So I thought, man, I'm in the wrong place. So I started applying to doc programs and, um, and um, I, I applied to a bunch of different places and I got into the University of Connecticut. And so I accepted admission there without even visiting, which was um, super crazy because I just assumed that the entire world would be just like Texas. Um, turns out it's not. And um, the move to Connecticut was a huge culture shock, but I didn't realize that until after I'd moved my family across the country. Um, but I had a fabulous experience there and really um, learned a lot. Like that was a life changing experience for me being in the doctoral program at UConn. So this was a huge evolution from me, for me, and I had no idea um, when I was at TAM that this is where I would end up. Uh, yeah, so don't freak out if you are at TAM thinking, wow, I have no idea what I want to do with my life. You have plenty of time to figure it out and many twists and turns in your life um, to end up where you might be. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hope. I appreciate the uh, fascinating uh, discussion and, and your, your presentation. Uh, that gives us some food for thought about our own students and uh, the experience they have and the purpose of what we do as well. Um, really, it's, it was a pleasure. And um, I always enjoy talking about my research and talking to TAM students. So um, this was a lot of fun for me. All right. Well, take care and hopefully we'll be in touch again soon. Absolutely. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, Hope. Uh, absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye.